Thank you. Thanks, Lana. Okay, now this is what we all pay our money for, basically. So, you know, now we've got uh, our opportunity to, to hear firsthand for yourself and your own ears uh, from each witness their experience. And the film does a wonderful job of, of piecing it all together, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a format. So, everyone here now is going to have their chance to, to, to say what they saw. Uh, how it made them feel, and perhaps a little bit about, you know, what it was like in the preceding years, you know, since after that time. We'll all have a good old bitch about authority. <laughs> Those damn people in authority. Sample for you. <laughs> the ones who, who, who hold the keys to these, to these, uh, these mysteries that we have. So, I'm just going to, first of all, I'll just introduce everybody. There'll be some familiar faces here. So you might have seen them on the big screen a little bit earlier. So I'll just introduce them all, then we can have a round of applause collectively. So we have Kevin Hurley, we have Dee Sadakay, we have Terry Peck, Colin Kelly, Joy Clark, Sue Savage, Paul Smith, Marilyn Smith, and of course we have Rosie and Shane as well. So <laughs> So the format will be a, a sort of a try to get to five, a five minute description. Oh, it's just so much to get through and the clock's just racing, so then better shut up. So I might, we'll just we'll travel around the table this way. Uh, I won't try to do it sequentially or anything like that. I've seen the film, I think that's okay. So, and you guys can just share the mic between you when it's time to talk. So I'll pass it over to Kevin just to perhaps uh, kick things off. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, at the time of uh, 1966, yeah, I was a uni student at Monash, so I was 21 years of age and I was studying engineering. Um, I lived at Murrumbina, if any of you know where that is, that's quite a distance from Westall. Um, on the day of the, when the kids saw the UFO, uh, I had an uncle whose kids were at primary school and in the afternoon he rings me up. I was actually home for a uni, and he said, guess what? There's the UFO is landed at the back of the school. I said, what? He said, I'm going to come down on my bike. So I rode my bike from Murrumbina <laughs> all the way down to Westall. <laughs> I, I met, my, met my uncle at the back of the school, and then my memory of what happened there, what the area was like, is nothing like what it is today. So it's, I find it very hard when I go into the Grange. I just can't relate the area. Anyway. I just remember this huge paddock of high grass, about two foot high, and I'm pushing my bike through on a path through this paddock where the kids had obviously used to run through. And as I'm pushing through my bike, I see a huddle of people. It's probably about 15 to 20 people, all in a huddle. When I get a bit closer, I see that there's Channel 9. And I know it's Channel 9 because they had one of those big outdoor cameras the guy had it on his shoulders and had Channel 9 playing on the side. I looked down to what the people were looking at. Wow, there's this very defined circle in the two foot grass. And it was very defined because the whole circle was completely flat. But more than flat, the grass was twisted round in a radial direction as if something had come down onto the ground and twisted round. So the grass was actually twisted round. And I also remember, which I hadn't actually just, um, mentioned this before, I also distinctly remember there was three pockets where the grass was exposed down into, down into the dirt. So there were three spots. And I, I recently saw a picture of what one of the um, school kids had drawn of the UFO and they looked up, up at it in the sky and they saw that it had three protrusions on the bottom and I thought, Wow, that's what I remember now that I saw on the ground. Anyway, um, we looked at that and thought, wow, that's incredible. We saw it on the television that night. The next day I told some of my mates and they said, oh, let's go back. So we, both of us, we had our bikes. We did the same trip from Murrumbina. We drove down to West Orc. As we got in close to the paddock, I suddenly realised, oh no, they've got a barrier around it. So I thought, oh, let's just stuck under the barrier. 
So I'm just about to duck under this under the barrier to get into the cave, and suddenly a military guy jumps up. He said, "Don't you come here! Go away! Go away! You must go away!" Oh no! So we get back on our bikes and we ride all the way back home. We talk about it. About a week later, I said, "Ah, oh, let's go back and have another look." So we go back and down. Get back down to where we have seen the paddock. Oh no! The grass has been cut, but it wasn't just cut. The grass was completely, all grass was removed. In other words, it, it wasn't as if someone had gone through with a slasher and there was big heaps of grass that had been cut. No, it was nothing like that. It was just cut right down to the ground. So we walk across to where the, um, the circle, we, we see the circle, and that area was burnt. It's absolutely burnt. Oh, no. So then the next thing that that happened with that was, I was quite uh, pissed off to put it wildly. <laughs> over the next few days, in all the papers they were saying, uh, the kids saw a high altitude balloon was in the area. That's what they saw. No, this is not right. So I then wrote a series of letters to the newspapers, and I think it was the Herald Sun and the Argus. And I also then discovered that there was a Victorian UFO Society at the time, so I wrote a letter to them. Um, didn't hear any more about this until about 10 years ago. I get a phone call from this lady called Rosie Jones. She says, I'm with the ABC uh, documentary producer. Um, are you Kevin Hurley? You, saw it, you, you were involved in the UFO site in 1966. I said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> she actually found the article that I wrote to the Victorian UFO Society. So since that I've been quite involved in all these various uh, things. Thanks Kevin, that's great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Quite a very compelling uh, experience. Now I'd like to pass it across to Dee. Hi everybody. Um, I wasn't with the Western High School students. Um, I was at Clayton North Primary School and back then I was only seven years and four months old. And um, <laughs> I, remember play, I remember playing in the playground and just looking and it was a clear day and, um, and I looked up in the sky and I could see this, I thought it was a plane, but it didn't have a tail. And um, so I, I was looking at it and I thought, there's no tail on that plane. So I just followed it with my eyes and it came around and then all of a sudden it just, so it was just straight like this and um, and then it just went on its side like that, which was like that, so I could see the top of it and then it just went off and it was silver and round. And um, that's all I saw. Um, another girl in the playground saw it as well and I asked her when we go inside to tell the teacher and she said, yeah, okay. But then when we lined up to go in, and she said, I'm not telling anyone, I'm not, I'm not. And uh, so I didn't tell anyone either, and um, only being so small. And uh, I, my, mum, my mum said I told her many, many years later. I don't remember telling her. She didn't do anything. She was a new Australian to the country. I didn't have any siblings or, you know, so I just kept it to myself. And then many, many years later, I told my children that I do believe in, oh, now, UFOs. Back then it was flying saucers. Um, and they grew up with that because even my daughter of 36 believes and knows about today, which is good. And then I was in the waiting room with my mother, who has passed away many years ago now, and um, waiting for her. And I picked up um, a magazine, as you do, because I never buy them. And, um, and then I opened up, because it's 2006 copy, oh, yep, and there was the um, Shane's, Shane's article. And that's how I got in touch with Shane. And then from there, I got in touch with George and have been part of the group and being able to validate what I saw. Mm, that's really, really fascinating. So it's a relief. It's um, like validation but for today. And then I went to West High Primary School in, two, um, in 1970 year one, form one, and I kind of asked a few students, but I knew at that time they would have been my age, so, so they wouldn't have understood or believed, and I didn't ask anyone else. And um, so I left it there, um, but I knew what I, what I saw, I've always maintained that. 
And um, until, yeah, and then this validated um, my, my, what, my belief, what I saw. And, and today, for 20 years I've been driving to my work, and I go up Westall Road, and there's a Grange sign, Westall Heisman sign, and sometimes I see the kids in uniform, and then I go up on Danny on the road past my primary school, Clayton North Primary School, and that's what I've been doing for 20 years as well. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, that's oh, well, no worries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Especially for someone who was so young at that time, too. It's, uh, it's, it's even probably takes it to a, a, a special level being, you know, so much younger. Yeah. So that's great. So I'd like to uh, give Terry the opportunity now to, to share <laughs> her experience as well. Thank you, Terry. Hi, everybody. And I'd like to say thank you for coming. I was quite gobsmacked when I turned up today because I actually wasn't going to come myself. And I thought, no, I will go along. And um, I realise now that I'm quite privileged to have actually witnessed such a phenomenon. Um, I was a, a West Joel High School student. Um, I'd like to be able to say I was about four at the time, but I wasn't. I was about 11. Um, and on the day it happened, I was playing cricket out on the field. Um, and quite a few of us noticed these three discs up in the sky, like round silver discs. And of course everybody stopped and we were all pointing at it. And then Mr Greenwood was the first teacher that came out onto the oval. So he witnessed it as well. And then one of them appeared to go down above the Grange, whereas where we, that's where we used to go and play our sports, our cross-country runs. And I was always a bit of a daredevil at school. So I ran to the fence in the corner and jumped over. Um, and as you would have seen in the documentary, I did arrive at this uh, area where it had landed um, just as it was starting to take off. So I was actually quite close to it, probably, I believe, about three or four metres away from it. Um, and it, it, my memory, your memory does fade a little bit over the years, but from what I remember, it was a round silver disc like everyone else has described. It had lights underneath it. It was throwing off a light sort of a humming noise and I could feel some heat coming off it. So it just appeared to sort of rise up above the ground fairly slowly and then it turned on its side and it just went bang, that's it, disappeared almost. It went up and joined the other two and they just disappeared literally. Did they so fly away or did they just like they disappear? Just, they, no, they, they seemed to go straight up. So they yes. just disappeared, it was so fast. So quick. They, so quick, so I believe, that's my belief, that it definitely was something from somewhere else. I, I don't believe it was anything from um, Earth. <laughs> it was just so, they wouldn't have had anything that could move that fast. Um, so all that business about weather balloons and um, all the other things that they came up with was just rubbish. Um, and we were definitely all told not to talk about it, which I think I went home and told Mum and she just thought I was being ridiculous and just forgot about it. Um, but it, it definitely was covered up. We, we were all threatened not to talk about it. Um, the news crews were all outside the school. I, I didn't talk to anyone on the news. I just went straight home and um, told Mum. So what about my story? Yeah. I just butting down. What about the follow up uh, the next day? Oh yes, well actually I did leave one bit out. When I arrived at the scene where it was um, just taking off, there were two other girls. Um, one was Tanya um, and she appeared to be fainted to me. She was on the ground, she was quite hysterical and an ambulance arrived at the school and took her away. Now I was friends with Tanya, she was a migrant um, and they didn't speak a lot of English, but I used to call into her house. We were quite good friends. And I did go to visit her the day after and was just all locked up. And I was told she'd gone, she'd moved. And they knew nothing about it. So that was all covered up as well for some reason. That's interesting, correct. So it almost takes it to, I don't know, invasion of body snatches or something. Yes. <laughs> just you know, disappearing and it's really quite, uh, it's quite disturbing, isn't it? It was disturbing. And it's I disturbing. think her family were really worried about it. Yeah. So they just didn't want to have any publicity and no. I don't know, there might have been illegal migrants, I don't know. Absolutely. Just think about that from your own point of view, your own family. If, you know, if something like that happened in your own in your own house, it's uh I know ja uh, Jackie Argent. Uh, you know she uh, has released statements. It was actually on the uh, on the video, and uh, she she was very very concerned about. And, uh, and even to this day, she um, you know she does speak of that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So on that note, I will now pass it over. Thank you very much, Terry.
I now like to throw it across to Colin Kelly to uh, to give us what he saw yeah. on that day. Okay, uh, look, thanks again everybody. I uh, didn't believe there was so much interest in this and uh, we do appreciate your attendance and yeah, hearing us out. Ironically, the um, back, in, uh, back in those school days, our, our motto with the school, which was written up on the logo and what have you, was um, t uh, three words which said integrity and service. So what's your... What you, uh, the, the versions you're hearing uh, here today, um, well, that integrity is uh, certainly shining through. This did happen. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Uh, on that video, you uh, would have seen um, the kids running through the Grange. That was our backyard. Yeah, and uh, we, we used to you know, do all the cross countries. Yeah, you would have seen a kid running there with a black single with number five on it. That was me. Uh, <laughs> haven't changed much. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, can, I just, can I just say? Yeah, sure. So, sorry, Gay. Can I just say when I got to Westall High, naughty things happened. At <laughs> <laughs> they did with high. us too. <laughs> they were happening in '66 too, I think. Sure. <laughs> Look, my day, uh, I still um, yeah, quite uh, remember this very vividly. Uh, I was out on the uh, the Oval at the time, yeah, similar to um, Theresa here. And Terry. Terry. <laughs> oh, I knew oh, I was going to get that story. reaction. Oh. Yeah, back me up, Joy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was out on the Oval with a guy by the name of Gary Robertson. We were... You know, standing side by side, and, and I actually did hear. So, uh, we were just talking, and I did hear something. that was like a light whooshing sound, uh, and th this is probably something that's uh, that you know, hasn't been spoken about lately. Um, the, the actual noise and the sound, yeah, you know, that, uh, that was related. Well, I haven't heard that uh, very much, and that's probably something we need to uh, have a look at. But I had a slight whooshing sound, which um, attracted my attention. I I looked over to a so over where the power lines and things are, and I saw the, um, and once again I've heard conjecture of uh, one UFO, I've heard three, I can tell you there were three. Okay, so um, yeah, that, that is a definite, there was one uh, slightly larger than the other two that were flanking it. Uh, we sat there and watched it, I was probably one of the, well, um, we, we were probably uh, two of the first people who actually did see that. and. Uh, it's, you know, look, it was, they were just up there hovering and uh, there was just a very slight buzz that you could hear from the, uh, from the craft themselves. And, you know, obviously the, the discussion, the, the bell went the, um, and all of a sudden people just flopped out onto the oval and just started beelining for the back fence. I was, uh, uh, Gary Robertson and I were uh, just about to uh, bolt and uh, about 15 yards away from us, there was a teacher by the name of David McKay and he just looked at us, pointed out to us and he said, you two are going nowhere, stay. <laughs> and like little puppy dogs, we stayed. <laughs> but we, uh, we had a pretty good uh, view of, uh, of everything, that, of what was going on. And in the statements that I've actually made, uh, when the craft actually um, you know, went over the back to the, um, over the pine trees at the Grange, uh, I have never said that I, I saw it land, and I didn't. I saw it disappear over the back of the, uh, the pine trees. Uh, short time later, uh, it, uh, it came back. And it was you know, something that enlightened me off that um, show uh, that, that, that we've just seen. Um, was a statement that um, Victor Zakrusny had made. He's, and when they asked him, they said there were two over on the side. Uh, I initially, and I've got to plead guilty to this, uh, I actually questioned Victor's um, assumption of, uh, of the thing. but. Just seeing that, that prompted uh, um, something that I, I never considered. I saw one go over the uh, over the backyard towards the Grange. What happened to the other two? Mm -hmm. So I've got to I've got to recalculate my thoughts on on what Victor's uh, assumption was. Mm -hmm. um, look, we were all in different place, uh, places at the time. I know what I saw. Victor was probably in a different position to what I was. He saw something else. I've got to accept that. Yeah, I think that's why the confusion's out there about was there one, two or three, just because people are all over the place. 
yeah. and people saw one, two, or three discs or no discs. Yeah. So you know, so that's you know, it's the yeah. You know, I like well, that we sort of said here today that you know, categorically there was three discs, yeah. and I didn't even know that the one was larger than the other two. Yeah. So that's the, you know, was that the boss? <coughs> Look, you, know, you ask us um, how big were they? Well, I've heard everything from eight metres to fourteen metres, whatever. We were at school to learn our mathematics, and we've got to calculate the hypotenuse of uh, from where we were standing to where the uh, you know, the power lines were, and you work out a plus b equals c, and whatever. Uh, that's what we were at school. The um, hard to say. If you look, if you are to ask me from where I was standing, I would have said about twelve metres. Uh, in uh, the width of it, but yeah. I could be wrong. Yeah, it's hard to judge something yeah. over distance, both height and its actual size. It's not an easy thing to do. I saw it much lower than that, and yeah. I don't think it was 12 metres, I think it was about 6 metres. About 6 metres. Well, well, okay. If you've been to the playground and you've seen a recreated, beautiful little UFO that's lighting it up tonight, does that seem like the size? The circle on the ground would have given it yeah. away. You saw the circle yeah. quite close. Kevin, what's your thoughts? What yeah, well, size-wise? At the time, I thought it was was bigger than a car. Yeah. 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 Bigger yeah. than a car. Could have been a car and a half size. That's what I so, thought, too. Yeah. Because yeah. they were very visible to the yeah. naked eye. Yeah. yeah. Very visible to the yeah. naked eye. Yeah. All right, we'll keep it moving. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just keep going. Look, and I'll leave it. Settle, pedal. Look, I eventually did get down with Range uh, later on. Uh, I actually, uh, when I went home, uh, I asked my mother, and my mother's still alive, and I've asked her a few questions uh, about this uh, in the last few days, and uh, she actually, uh, I, I said, did you ever, ever remember me coming home and saying, um, yeah, with that? And she said, I could hear you from the end of the street. <laughs> so, uh, I said, did, did you believe me? And she said, yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. So, so she believed me. Uh, but she actually, uh, something she did say to me, uh, even as late as yesterday, was that um, the popular rumour going around Clayton at the time that, the, uh, that was uh, an American um, uh, experimentation going on now, she had never ever said that to me and I never prompted that from her. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, interesting. Look, other things have happened, we can talk later, but yeah. uh, go for it, Joy. Okay, I'll pass it across to Joy. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, Susan, Suzanne and I have a similar story, so Susie sort of asked me to talk for her as well as myself. Uh, we were both in science at the time, with the kid landing, flung the door open, screaming about the flying saucers in the sky and of course we all just looked at each other and right, burst into laughter and Mr Greenway said come on it's in, nearly the end of the period so we'll go. So we all bolted out down through the hallway out past the toilets out onto the oval and down towards the back of the oval where all the kids were milling around and yes there were flying saucers in the sky. Now Suzanne and I both um, have been back on numerous occasions and stood in where we thought we were standing and looked and tried to, because we always felt that one was slightly bigger than the other two. Whether it was a perception of, of distance or whatever, but one appeared, especially when it was up, because we saw them in the sky and then they disappeared over the back of the grange. Yeah. Now, Suzanne and I both had not agreed that we think that one was maybe <coughs> slightly forward when it came back up, so it gave the perception of being bigger than the other two. Right now, um, I don't remember any of the noise that was going on because it, it took me quite, a, because what I was looking at, the perception of what I was looking at was something that I'd never seen before. Mm. So it took a while for it to, so I wanted to try and absorb every little detail that I possibly could about what I was actually looking at because I'd never seen anything like that before. And then my most vividest memory after it when they disappeared, because they did, yes, and the aircraft came, them, da, da, da. The big one came up and it just went straight up in the air, like <laughs> turned on the side. And as it turned on the side, the sun hit the bottom of the disc and it just went <laughs> and the other two just went <laughs> and they were gone. <laughs> no, that's exactly what it was like, you know, it was so quick. Yeah. And then the army came very quickly. I have a very strong recollection mm. of the army came, coming across the road at the Hume Pipes and getting out of the Jeeps and whatever. Mm. Remember that very vividly. Also, I got interviewed by Channel 9 that night. It was on the news. 
uh, and I got detention as well. <laughs> and, um, but my elder sister was, was there too, but she was around the other side of the school. She took me down, she said, we're going down to see, she said, oh, I haven't seen it, but we're going down. Yeah. And we went down to the circle and she, we just crossed the road, the dirt was a dirt road between the primary school and the Grange. And we went in, and she can remember as clear as a bell too the the grass all flattened, but we did get frightened because there were um, army people and that in there. So she said, "Come on, come on, we've got to go, we've got to go." <coughs> but it was funny talking about Paul Dean. Um, I actually got interviewed at home twice. They came to our house twice. Norman. Paul Norman, yeah. sorry, Paul. Norman. It's all right. I'm a senior. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, Paul Norman came to the house twice. Now, we didn't even have the telephone on in those days, so I have no idea how they got our, our um, you know, address or whatever. But he came to the house and, and we sat around the table and I had to draw photos and my sister told them what she'd seen and, and whatever else. So, and then um, my father at the time was working at government aircraft factories yep. and he was making Ginevix and Mirages and whatever else and he was working down at Avalon quite a lot from Springvale, so I used to travel every day down there. And he came home, I must put in too, my parents were very supportive. They didn't make fun of me or laugh at me, it was very lucky. It was only all the stuff at school about, you know, don't talk about it, it's a weather balloon, you're massively hysterical, you know, whatever else. Um, Dad came home from work, it was about a month later, and said there's to be no more talk of the UFO. Now, I don't, unfortunately, my dad's passed, so I can't ask him whether he was just being a protective parent mm -hmm. or um, he'd been told from his end to, you know, put a hush-hush on mm -hmm. or just to, to put it down. Mm -hmm. But uh, my personal belief is that what I saw was something out of this world. I've never seen anything since. It's, I wish I'd would because it was the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me in my life and it's in my head and I cannot get it out no matter I can submerge it I can put it away for a while but you dr I drive past there and the hair stands up on the back of my neck and it's book it's there yeah. it's instantly yeah instantly. that's very similar to one Sullivan who had the encounter with but he, he is exactly the same way what he saw was incredible amazing saving his entire life uh, and obviously that's the case for everybody sitting here and uh, people in the audience who've had their own experience. Yeah, like I said, Suzanne and I have been back there quite a few times and just sort of tried to, you know, to, what do you think? Do you think it was over there, you know, was it close yeah. or for Just to sort of try and get in, in perhaps a bit of perspective of whether there were two smaller ones yeah. or whether it was just the distance or whatever. Right. I was trying to ask a quick question. How many of you saw the aircraft? The, the the assessments yep. up there. So sure. every a lot of people saw that. Yeah. Okay. Did you have anything else to add, No, no. no. This is just to say, I just the say box. to people, um, I don't have an issue. I've had issues over the years with being criticised when yeah. it started to come out. You know, I had drunk were you, had drugged were you, da da da. Yeah. I was twelve and a half for God's sake. <laughs> I was at school. You know, you stepped over the line, you got whack. You know, there was none of this. How, who do you think you are, business? Yeah. No, it didn't work that way. And and I had an argument with a young fellow. He said, no, no, it wouldn't happen. Couldn't happen. Da da da. And I said, look, I have one question for you, Luke. He said, what's that? I said, well, were you there? And he said, no. And I said, well, I was. End of story. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. Okay, it's really good stuff, guys. Thank you so much for that. So now I'd like to Paul pass across to Paul Smith. Now, Paul was perhaps a little older than, than the other uh, <laughs> students here at the school, because Paul, in fact, wasn't at the school. He was working hard in the, in the field next door, getting things ready for market. And he was about 16 years old. I age. was, I was 16. 16. So he's a little bit older. Uh, and I've interviewed Paul before and, and uh, very, very much in, enjoy his, his experience. So I'd like to pass across to you, Paul. Okay, no worries. Uh, I was, I was 16 years old and uh, wasn't expecting anything. That, that was supposed to be just a normal day loading up for market. But um, about 11, between 11 and 11.30, um, I just happened to look up 
and it was just there in front of me. There was an opening between the trees, the pine trees in grade, and the land, which was a lot lower. The trees were a lot lower over there, and there was an opening, and it was just sitting there, about 20 feet above the ground, not far at all. But I heard no sound from it. It was just glowing. It was a sort of whitish silver, and then it was as if it had been observing what was going on and because I spotted it, it started changing and the colour changed, it seemed to tip on its side a bit and then the colour started to become more bluey, green, mauvey and it was fading, it became translucent uh, it was a solid object to start with that went from translucent, transparent, you could see through it, and then it went like there was just this resonance left, like a gas or fumes or something, and that just moved around and it went into the trees, into the pine trees. But the trees didn't move. It wasn't a solid object going through there. It was some sort of residue or gas that went into the trees. There was nothing left of it. And my boss was there, he stood up, looked around, and um, he saw the tail end of what was happening, but didn't look particularly interested, and he turned around and went back to work again. But the next day, uh, an army guy came up in a jeep from the paddock where the um, circles were observed. And he came up, and it wasn't like an interview, it was more like he was being interrogated. It's like he wanted to find something out. And as he came up, my boss actually went up to him, and so I couldn't hear what they were saying. But he looked threatened, my boss did. And the guy, he was army guy, but he had sunglasses on, which I felt a bit strange. He had sunglasses on. And he was a solid guy about... 40 years old and uh, after my boss came back all he said was oh the kids have said they've seen a flying saucer and that's all he said and then we finished loading up the trailer we went back to the yard uh, I washed the carrots with the hose and normally he would help me but he left me with it he went down to the owner of the paddock uh, Robert Gulak and he was down there for about an hour and then he came back but he never discussed anything with me but I suggest I suspect he Robert Gulak and my boss are the two guys that were seen on the tractor down there that's what I suspect did you work for Marquesses? Or? N next door to Marquesses yeah sure yeah <coughs> yeah, it's so interesting because I always sort of, you know, with, with your description of what you saw, uh, with it going translucent. Yeah. You know, one of my theories was maybe if you're underneath it, it might still have appeared as a as a as an object, and then from the side maybe it's it started to do some sort of a camouflage. No, sort of and I've always felt uncomfortable because yeah. my description of it is so totally different from what the school yeah. saw. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I think the, <coughs> phenomenon, the phenomenon can, can uh, throw us uh, many things to puzzle about. Yeah. And I think that is one of the key... But I didn't feel threatened by it. No. It's something that just happened, mm. and um, there was nothing I could do about it, mm. and I don't feel that I was harmed by it, mm. and I don't feel uncomfortable going... I take my grandchildren to the Grange, they climb in the UFO and they have a yeah. wall down there Yes. and I don't feel uncomfortable there No. and even as a child when I used to go over there yeah. it was a bit eerie because yeah. the trees at that time the branches all touched the ground it was this high with uh, pine needles you know <laughs> and you'd run through there and bounce on them Yeah. it was so different I tell you what, if you've not been to the Grange you must go it truly is a unique place, and it's, it's, we're, we're lucky that it's still there. Yeah, yeah you know, they, they used to race uh, scramble bikes down they there. Did. Oh, yes. wow. yeah. still Thank there. you, thank you very much for that. Hello, Marilyn. I think uh, 
It was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> it. Should really be on a t-shirt somewhere. Like, it's just one of those, uh, one of those statements that uh, always brings a smile to my, uh, to my face every time I see it. So we will be very interested to hear your perspective. It was worth it. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. I haven't um, been to any of the reunions over the years because of my work commitments, and I'm just gobsmacked at the interest. It's just amazing. Um, my story sort of runs along the same lines as Joy jo uh, jo and Terry, that I was in class at the time, as you saw on the documentary, um, and this person just ran into the classroom, not one of our uh, person from our class, um, threw us up against the door and said, there's a flying saucer in the oval. And everybody jumped up and you know, went to run out and the teacher said, sit down, it's not break time yet. Uh, a few minutes later, you know, the bell went off and we just bolted, you know, out into the oval and saw this, I only saw one um, flying saucer and it appeared to have, was lifting off the oval and then it just sort of hovered and I remember and I hadn't sort of recalled this, but people talking about sound, there was a humming sound, I remember, distinctly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and it just took off. Uh, it didn't really disappear, but it just sort of went into the distance. Um, my girlfriend and I ran to the end of the oval and climbed the fence and sat there. And we could see it in the distance, sort of going below um, the horizon and rising up again. Um, we just cried. We were terrified. We thought it was the end of the world. Um, seriously scary stuff, um, but from that day, I believed that there was something out there, um, and I truly believe that you know, that hopefully in my lifetime, um, that you know, it's proven to be true because I, I truly believe. And I don't talk about you know seeing UFO people occasionally; it'll come up, and it creates a huge amount of interest. Um, but you know, I know people are sceptical, but I know what I saw, mm -hmm. and I'm going to change my mind. And I too have taken my grandchildren to the Grange, um, my daughters also, because um, yeah, it's sort of like probably the only one in the world to me, but my picture's there, and the UFO. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. 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 Does anyone remember who the boy was who came running in? So no one not heard his name or no, there's just a boy? Just the boy. A boy appeared. I was outside already. You were outside already. Yeah. I thought he might have been out there playing sport and he came rushing in, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe? Yeah, yeah. could have. Well that's probably yeah, probably was someone that was out there. So, no, someone who was had to have been out there. Um, I can't recall anyone leaving the scene from where I was and I was out there. And you were, yeah, so there you go, that's right, you know, you know the teacher yeah. said. Unless they were in another classroom and seen it out the window or something, you yeah, don't possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but as you see, like, you know, once, once something yep. out there, the genie's out of the bottle, everybody's going to go yeah. running. Yeah. And I'm sure Andrew agree with once he said, well, oh, let's go, look, oh, I regret that decision. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. And it's interesting, you know, when we talk about the sound of the UFO, because you talk about it, you know, it's a soft humming, or was there a wind blowing at the time? Was there was, I can't recall wind. No? no. It was, uh, which is day. like a, 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 a low drone sound, yeah. um, you know, from it. Um, I did, you know, like I heard the whoosh, you know, like that came across uh, from uh, when it first came over, and that's what attracted my attention. Yeah. So, and when it disappeared. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What I love about this is, is that uh, is, is there's a lot of cooperation here. You know, in the, in the way that you guys are describing the objects, you know, the, the you know, traveling like this, turning like that, it, it kind of also corroborates the, the deep thing or the Baldwin photo where that thing is also on its side as well. Not entirely the same object if you've seen that photo. Yeah, I can assure you, no collusion. I haven't seen these guys for 50 years. <laughs> yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. So, you know, so that's. Uh, oh, still as gorgeous as ever. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you told me 50 years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what so, so what, I, what, I, what I'm curious about too, also, is you know, like, I mean, you guys left the schoolyard, or some of you left the schoolyard. 66. They were pretty authoritarian back then. Like, mm. that's a pretty major misdemeanor. I would have thought to have jumped the fence and. 
you know, Paul says you guys were hesitating over by the things <laughs> whether you're going to run over there or not. So, if you uh, knew um, Frank Sambleby, who was the uh, principal, he was an extreme disciplinarian, yeah. and uh, obviously you've heard the, the stories of detention. That's what uh, we I was threatened with detention. Um, you know, that's why I stayed uh, exactly where I was. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, later in the day, uh, he, you know, we have been called in to, to sort of, and they tried to uh, restore um, some stability back into the school. That was not going to happen. You know, like, uh, we were all in our groups and we were yak, 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 yak. <laughs> and, uh, well, I think they gave up in the end. And <laughs> I'd be interested to hear um, you know, like, um, the stories of the next day, you know, because uh, mm. you know, you know, it's spoken of the, uh, the guys in the suits. Yeah, you know, they came to school. That happened. That it did happen. really happened. These guys turned up in suits to the school yeah. the next day yeah. and started to, to going. Did they go? To they just target particular people, or they go oh, to they, classrooms? They or? collectively got us. You know, look, we're in an assembly, yeah. and they, and, uh, they uh, effectively tried to uh, deflate what we'd actually seen uh, and. You know, literally say, look, you, um, you forget that, uh, what you've actually seen. This has not, hap um, has not happened. It's very interesting, um, and I remember Shane saying something to me, and I do remember it. It was just before Easter, mm -hmm. and we had uh, school holidays um, yep. yeah, tacked onto mm -hmm. that, and I think they hoped that, given that time span, that we'd come back to school and just settle back down. Yeah. 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 Were these Australians? Can you remember that oh, yeah, they well, were Australian yeah, sure. people coming in to tell you guys, look, yes. forget about this, nothing yes. happened? You didn't look, see anything? No, uh, oh, um, and I do remember, um, remember going past the office at the time and uh, when Jackie uh, Argent was, um, you know, she was uh, just going into the office uh, with those people and, uh, you know, I, I, I thought nothing of it at the time, but uh, I've since seen the, uh, you know, the, the show and, um, and now I know what happened. Yeah, and mm -hmm. also the the Tanya story. Uh, I actually um, I did pass the uh, come past the ambulance. Amb ambulance was parked in the um, what right up the back near the canteen beside yes, Sykes's yes. house. Now yeah. the back was uh, facing the school, not from the roadside where the um, you know like any uh, outsiders could see it. And I actually saw um, Tanya in the uh, in the back of the um, you know, the ambulance. Somebody asked me. They said, uh, the, um, "They said you sure it was a girl." Two things I was interested in. in uh, <laughs> <laughs> one was sport, and the other was girls. girls. That was Tanya. <laughs> 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 <That's funny. laughs> um, probably another thing. I, look, I'm yes, sorry, I'm stealing the floor okay. from you. Um, <laughs> You get the ca uh, conjecture from uh, you know, people trying to discount you, and um, yes, you know, and as uh, Joy said, yeah, yeah, what were you on at the time? Yes, we were uh, the age that we were, and given the uh, disciplinarian of the uh, the area, no, you know, we were we were twelve and a half, thirteen years old, mm -hmm. and uh, um, somebody asked me the other day, they said, um, Do you, uh, are you r religious and things? And I've never, nobody had ever said that to me before. You know, in regard to this, uh, look, I'm not atheist, mm. but considering what we've actually seen there, uh, I will, I'm convinced something's out there. So, uh, yeah. so, you know, so religion, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, as I said, I'm not an atheist. No, but something's got to be out there. No, so. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So, and so the next day, and you guys are obviously back in class again. Did any of the teaching staff? that point ever mention it again in any way, no. shape or form, none of the teaching staff said another no. word about it. No, no, not that I recall. No, no, no. no. And the other thing too about the um, being interviewed, off, interviewed by Channel 9, yep. it was outside the school yards. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we were, yeah, we did get detention from that, but in my mind, that was outside the school yards, so it sort of didn't count. So yeah. I thought that was a bit... Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. <laughs> Bad that they actually yeah. had detention for that. Yeah, that's right. Because I remember school grounds. Yeah, because I remember yeah. when I was talking and, and the man in blue, and I, I assumed it was a policeman. I think you know yeah. that's what I saw of the uniform. And he put his hand on my left shoulder and he he said to me, "Now stop talking and you go back go back inside the school grounds." Yeah. Yeah. And then he turned his back on me and said to the man who was filming the reporter, "And you stop talking and stop filming and you go away." 
Yeah, and we did, you're right, well, we were yeah. definitely outside of the school ground. Yeah. Can I just say something? They actually put that on the air that night on mm. the right, news, yeah. and it was uh, Eric Pierce introduced the news. I saw that news segment and I remember the interview being cut off. In, in the yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That's how they put it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say something further? Um, the thing, from my point of view, something actually happened. And it, you know, we need to have some sort of, uh, somebody to pop up and, and explain to us exactly what they were doing. I don't know whether they were, it was from outer space. I mean, I, I don't deny that as a possibility. But, mm. but look, the, the amount of trouble they've gone to to try and cover this up, mm. um, if it was just a weather balloon, they wouldn't be going to all this trouble. They wouldn't have these, <coughs> these military guys going through, analysing the ground and then cutting the grass and destroying it. I mean, Excellent point, Kevin. That's right. You, you, you know, I can hear a bit of Called rubber weather balloon is uh, not going to be of interest to, to anyone really, you know, realistically. So, how do you push the grass? Yeah. A teacher apparently had a camera and wanted to take it all. She did, yeah. That's correct, yes. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So, we've had, you know, you look at the whole thing, is you've had people who have been intimidated, you've had property taken, you've had evidence destroyed. So it, it certainly cannot be some type of mundane explanation. The, the sound factor too of uh, what we yeah, what's been raised that um, discounts a lot of the weather balloon. Absolutely, absolutely. Weather balloons don't go. That's right. And I think you know, a twenty minute response time. A twenty. You're talking 1966, which you know, it's almost seems like. A long time ago. It is. A long time ago. I might call it medieval times, but it's a long time ago. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Well, so it's not, that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not that long. So, so a 20 minute response, would we get a 20 minute response today? <laughs> no. You know, you couldn't go up in traffic today. No. That's right. You know, to get there in 20 minutes. So, yeah, but it'd already be online, wouldn't it? So. Well, it would be. Oh, yeah. People, yeah. People, well, YouTube. YouTube, exactly. So back in the time there, you think, and, and I suppose also you've got to remember too that, that Westall Clayton in '66 was probably the outer of Melbourne. Oh, yeah. It's not Berwick or Pakenham. Yeah. And one thing from my UFO experience is in investigation, I can well and truly assure you that UFOs love quiet places. Yeah. So they, they appear in quiet places, and at that time, the school it's very rural. was very rural. Yeah, power line. The power lines. The power lines. They were attracted to the power lines. Yeah. So somebody, uh, and they're out there um, at the moment. I was talking to them just before. Um, raised the issue about um, you know, the possibility of um, observation of children, because children do not offer a threat to True. anyone. It's worth consideration. Absolutely. Were they were they watching us? Um, uh, I think the, uh, South, think the South African uh, yeah, situation yeah. was uh, was uh, yeah. school was yeah. kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, it's an interesting um, analogy, really. So. Maybe oh. radar picked them up too before we actually saw them and contacted someone who came quickly there. So it might have been 20 minutes, it might have been 40 minutes. That's, yeah, they could have had because those good aircraft point. from Moorabbin got there pretty quick too. So did someone else know about? Were they tracking it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the system's not an F1 eleven. Like, no. You, know, you don't get those little babies up in the air. You know, I mean, and scramble a, a jet fighter. Yeah, the major thing too, we were so used to the aircraft flying over all the time. That's why you know we knew what we were. It was totally different. Yeah. You know, wasn't a plane. You know. Every Sunday there used to be a Mustang fly over Clayton from Moorabbin Airport. So yeah, we knew our aircraft. You knew your aircraft, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm not from Melbourne, but, but you know, but yeah, you just got to hang around Moorabbin Airport for five minutes. To see, you know, you know, 20 different types of aircraft, and when you live in the area, I'm sure it's a everyday event. So something truly unusual is silver that has a humming noise to it that can be silent, tilt, and then <laughs> off at 100 miles an hour is not a Mustang. No. So it's not a weather balloon. No. Uh, you know, so yeah. That, and it wasn't massively hysterical either. No, no. no. The, uh, 
the speed that that, uh, you know, that the craft um, disappeared at was, you know, and I've heard Joy say this in the past, was uh, so much in excess uh, of anything around that time that could fly at that speed. And even then. Exactly. And, and then Paul said, like you saw this thing on the scene, like a projection, and like nothing like that could have been projected in 66, or they had to have anything that would, that would shoot off like that. I mean, we hadn't been to the moon yet. You know, this is this is before the moon. You know, like you know, we're, we're doing Mercury and and the other, you know, Gemini's and things like that. But in '66, we we hadn't really, you know, gotten that far. And we really only just not that many years away from when Sputnik was put up there for the first time. So you know, technologically, we weren't much more advanced at that time than World War Two, really. So, quick question too. Um, you you were up at Clayton North. Um, do you, do you remember approximately what time uh, did you actually saw that? Because I, I will tell you that uh, you know, like this happened around quarter past ten, ten half past ten you know, at West Hall. Okay, so I, if that's the case, it would have been normally in play. That would make sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that, that would absolutely make sense. And there was only one, I only saw one. Yeah. Do you uh, also remember seeing any other kids? Seeing it at the primary school, like you and your you and your friends saw it. Do you remember who any other children saw it at the primary school? George said that there was another girl yeah. um, that saw it. She was on the playground, whereas I was not near the playground. At the same yeah. school that you were at, yeah. 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 On the other one she was. I've yeah. got a video of her giving her, her description of what she saw. Yeah. And it was exactly the same description that you said that was sort of in the sky just sitting there. And you thought she wouldn't be there and off away. But headed mm. towards West Hall. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. From South Clayton coming up to North Clayton and then doing a so called the U big U turn mm -hmm. and going back down. Once again, a school. Mm. A school, yeah, a school, yeah. yeah. I always like that point about them observing children. I think yeah. that is perhaps something that they do. And one thing you know about UFOs is they love water. You know, they they're always sucking up water somewhere. <laughs> uh, they love their power lines. power lines. They come up and get a little bit of a bit of charge. <laughs> Who knows? You know, maybe they can, maybe they can, uh, you know, cook their toes or something. I don't know when they pass over and all that. But you know, these are these things that are, that are coming out in this, in this, you know, from Westall certainly do play out in other UFO cases. So you guys are certainly not alone in the similarities that, that occur that occur in Victoria here, which has been a UFO hotbed over quite a long time. In fact, probably going back to Aboriginal times, I'm sure there's, there's been, they've been here for a very long time, whatever they are, wherever they come from. Well, the Dandenongs are supposedly UFO little hotbeds. Yeah, yeah, I'll be, like, obviously, uh, you know, like that Pakenham, Cranburn, through the Walton, Dandenong area is an incredibly busy UFO spot. It really is. We get many reports, I'm not going to digress too much, but we get many reports of the amber balls of light flying around Craneburn and Pound Road and all that. There's just some areas out there where you guys can probably go out tonight and see something, you know. So, yeah, so this, this story is as uh, an important part to the overall Victorian world UFO, uh, you know, puzzle, puzzle, because that's exactly what it is. It still most certainly is a puzzle. So, how are we going to time, you? Two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. Can I just say that? Yeah, sure. Um, not long ago, my work colleague, she Googled my name, and she said, oh, and she knows me quite well. She said, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> and I said, what? She said, oh, you saw a UFO. And I said, yes. And she said, and I said, so if you think I'm crazy, that means over 100 people are crazy too. And yeah. she shut up. Yeah. 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 She's not said any more, and um, yeah. Yeah. Is, it, is it true this is uh, probably the yeah one of the largest uh, sightings uh, in the southern hemisphere? Absolutely, yeah. And I mean daylight. Mm. Yeah. You know how often do UFOs rock up at you know half past ten in the morning? I think they got it wrong. Yeah, I think they got it wrong. I reckon they wanted to come down and power up, and they thought it was night instead of day. Yeah. Maybe, day. maybe maybe they maybe they just come from the dark side of the earth. Yeah. So the kids come out at quarter past ten. Yeah, there's recess. That's why they come to observe the kids. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, it's an that's an interesting observation. As I said, uh, um, this conjecture of um, schools and children. Uh, it's. Uh, 
I think it's uh, another What do you think, Jude? Possibly no. they probably know with children you're not armed, are you? Yeah. No, no, we're right. Right. no, no threat. Yeah. Children aren't packing AK-47 like you, you know. <laughs> no. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's not happening. So it's, it's quite. And there's, been, there's, there's other there's other school UFO cases around even in Australia. There's there's other primary school cases where you know they're not coming to mind, but I know there are other little little reports from primary schools and schools around the place where every now and then something comes down for a bit of a look, you know, and sees what's uh, sees what's going on. So that's uh, that's really good. So all right, well, I might call it now. Um, so we have time to. Go and have another break. But I just wanted to also mention that uh, we had our panel up here of Westall witnesses and filmmakers and Shane, but there are also other people out here in the audience who were also there at Westall on that day. So I want to say a special thank you and welcome to them for, for attending as well. And thank you very much. For that. As you said, there's, there's 200 people that have seen this object. Okay, I'll start off with you down here. Hi, I'm Jackie. Oh, sorry, I don't know Jackie. Hello, I'm Jackie, and I'm very um, pleased to have come today. Um, I've bought many tickets to go see the Hollywood films about New York Space, and today it was the best purchase after that day. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've got two questions. My, the first question is, I have two girls, and I'd like to share with them your story. So it continues, because um, someone tried to um, shut you guys up down, and with everything, so I'd like the story to continue. Um, how do you guys share the story with your grandkids and the next generation? Um, yeah. Okay, so we might get one, two, or maybe three answers. Well, you've got Grandchildren. Okay. Right. Well, I've got four grandchildren, uh, and I just said one day we're going to go to the Grange, which is where Nana saw a UFO. What's a UFO? A flying saucer. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and took them to the Grange where the playground is, and showed them a picture of me when I was 14 at Dan Nocturne, but that particular um, paper is there, that article, is on a poster board there. Um, hence, they thought that I was memorialised. Um, yeah, and just, you know, they had a look around and played on the equipment, thought it was fabulous. Um, so, yeah, and of course I thought we were here about what's going on with this as well, so. Anyone else have something to add to that? Dean? Hi. Um, my daughter is a school teacher, 12 years of teaching, primary school and now in secondary school. And like I said before, I've spoken to her many, many times, and she knows about today, but um, sometimes some of her students will challenge the UFO theory and and she'll just tell them to Google West or UFO. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So we'll keep moving on. Uh, yeah, gentlemen, next year they're in the same area. Hi, uh, to the panel. My name's Don. Look, how Australia was back then, we were very much post World War II governed in our thoughts and how the government controlled the country. With how things have changed in society itself, Originally, you would have had to stick to that cloak of secrecy, usual on our thing. How do you feel about telling people nowadays? Doesn't okay. Don't so, have you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about it now, but for many years I wasn't because people were very sceptical and I didn't want to come across as being, you know, something wrong with me. Um, but I find now that the young generation, um, I have a daughter, and she, I didn't tell her about it until just recently when I had contact with Shane and she absolutely believes that there can be something else out there and I think a lot of young people do. They've got much more open minds these days to things like that and um, I don't have any problem with it now. Yeah, very good. Uh, now, gentlemen in the hat there with the beer. G'day. Um, thanks for coming today. It's been good. Um, my question is for all of this. I'm just curious. Uh, days after the event, did any of this Feel as though you were being followed or watched by, say, the mini 
But I think uh, to, just to add to that, and there's something we raised before that um, yeah, you've got to think of the time when that, that actually happened. Uh, we were approaching at Easter that week, yeah. and then there were school holidays after uh, after that. And uh, I think the authorities, or even the school uh, authorities, uh, hoped that um, things had settled down, and yeah. that's uh, that's how it really panned out. Yeah, we, we look when we got back to school, we, we were still in our various little groups, and we were talking about it amongst ourselves, but. Um, it was not a, not a lot sort of made up. Yeah. Yeah. No, that lady there. No, I just get it and I say, I was there, I was one of the students. Who was her name? Gail. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Hey, Gail. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had the um, video of the, the volumes of the hover, and I think there was one other person from what um, Shane has said, hover over the house for a week in Clayton. And it would go down and it would go up really fast and then zigzag sideways and all these pretty coloured lights. They're very, very fast. And it did it for a week around that time that it happened at school. And you might jump the best and it's pretty much the story of all these people here. But I have got two questions if I'm allowed yeah. to ask two. Okay, okay. I would like to ask the people that were there because I've never known this. Their headmistress, they had a breakdown. Oh, Mrs. They, Alexandra. They were screaming like a baby. Yeah, Mrs. And Alexandra. And the put, and she was all wrapped up in, in the yep. straight jacket and taken away. Yep. Did she have, she genuinely was, um, did she have a breakdown over what yep. happened? There? Um, well, it was pretty uh, close to something. Because they yeah. had told us, and I just wondered whether it was Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, because I remember that as clear as a bell too. Because okay. she was such a glamorous lady with yes. the red lipstick yes. and the she nails and the, and, and the hair and the hair. Yeah, and yeah. The yeah. yeah they, that's right. They, they put her in, in the whole, yeah, yeah. And they her up, up in the straight jacket and took her out. That's right. Yeah, they did. No, they did. Yeah, 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 they have any of you since experienced an out of body experience since then where you've actually gone up and had um, some like little extra terrestrial beings that have taken and want you to join them and then you've actually come back? Mm -hmm. It was just like the explanation of that um, flying saucer disappearing and seeing like the rainbow and, and it was just like an out of body experience seeing that disappear. Have any of you experienced that on a personal level where they've wanted you to go? No. No. Okay, no. Look, uh, Gail, Gail, yeah, just, just briefly, uh, uh, somebody else asked me a similar question of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like anything that had followed up. Uh, once again, Gary Robertson and I, um, about, uh, about eight years later, uh, we were driving up Police Road, you know, pouring rain about seven o'clock at night. With me too. Sorry? It was raining with me. Yeah, well, Gary and I uh, swore, you know, look, uh, I, I was in the passenger seat, Gary was driving, and we slammed the anchors on a, of this car, we swore that we'd run over somebody. Yeah, you know, look, uh, uh, we, uh, the, we thought that there was somebody uh, right in front of us, uh, uh, yeah, and that we'd hit that person. Pouring rain, we both hopped out the car and uh, said, um, did you see that? And both Gary and I did see it. There was nothing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's as near as uh, that's as near as I've uh, I've come to. Okay. Okay. We're going to move on to the next question because we'll get moving along. Uh, over here in the back. Below here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
on to that because that was, um, to be honest, that was a recreation of our experience. So that actually was not in the Channel 9 archive, but it's exactly what happened. So we discovered that they had a card, a catalogue card for, for flight source of the exact date, etc., etc., as as you saw. And when I went to look for it, there was nothing there. So there was no explanation, there was no film there. I spent just countless hours trying to get them to track it down. I had them looking in piles of film that were all over the sort of Channel 9 headquarters. And what happened to Channel 9 when they were uh, renovating or build, uh, they were building a car park and they used a lot of their audio tapes and video tapes as landfill. So there, there was not much of a um, respect for archives back in the day and they were particularly interested in archiving material unless they could make money out of it. And they decided to ditch a whole lot of their videotapes, their very valuable archive, and you know, shove them under the ground to fill out the car park. So it may be there. Okay, I'm going to go right over to you. Okay, right at the very top there, under the spotlight. Um, my got... question is for Colin. Your question for Colin? Sure. Yeah. Colin, you seem to have had the best vantage point. Um, would you think that perhaps they're observing children and the quick response time would be that perhaps authorities might be going from school to school and perhaps doing a count on children and how many our population has, hence the stay type? Or something, yeah. um, or yeah. how long did you do this? Yeah, look, um, you know, I think this come up in conversation uh, before, and like, given the, uh, the history, you know, with the South African um, you know, school with, uh, with children and, um, and uh, like other, other instances, the North Clayton one, uh, as well as Whistle, it, it just seems very interesting that, um, that there were children involved in, uh, in all the like in all of those instances. Uh, now, were they observing us? I, I don't know. I probably never will know, but uh, it, it just seems a, an interesting uh, sidelight to um, you know, down to the story. Uh, the re you're talking of response times and, and the like. Uh, you know, it's a bit beyond, my, uh, beyond our control, really. Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, you know, I, and, and it, I'll probably get on to the uh, response from the uh, from the um, from the military and uh, and the um, authorities and what have you. It just seemed that it was uh, so very quick response that they had to. I, I just get the feeling that they had to know something. Mm. So anyway, I'll leave okay. that. Oh, thank you very much. My name's Rick, and I just want to once again thank you so much for sharing your Sunday with us. This your story is absolutely fascinating, I really are. I've got a two prong question, if I may. First of all, for the panel, and it's about tenure, um, and the second part will be to Shane. Um, I was a little bit confused. Terry, you were telling us how that you went down to the Grange and you saw her on the ground there. And, and then she was taken away by ambulance, but Colin told us that she was taken away from the school. Mm. I was just wondering if you could clarify exactly what happened there. And my question for Shane is, yeah. what were you able to discover about her fate? Were you able to find any health records, ambulance Victoria records, which uh, detail what happened to her after the incident? Mm. Well, I, I think she fainted. Sorry. I think she fainted. Um, and when she came to, I think her other her friend that was with her must have helped her back to the school. I can't really remember exactly. And then I just remember seeing the ambulance and I wasn't even sure it was Tanya that was in it until, you know, a few of us hovered around and we realised it was her. But I didn't actually see her carried back or anything like that, so I'm not sure about that. I was too wrapped up in thinking what I was seeing myself. <laughs> you know, it's pretty hard to take everything in when you see something like that. Okay, I'll, I'll just top, top that up, um, and it, look, it's interesting uh, sort of seeing um, you know, what some of these situations and uh, people deal with, uh, with situations a lot differently to others, and uh, I just get I got the impression look um, something has uh, distressed Tanya dramatically, 
and uh, she's obviously re uh, reacted um, and um, uh, the, you know, the ambulance required ambulance attention, and, mm -hmm. um, and that, that's the last we actually uh, we saw of Tanya. Yeah. She was screaming. She was screaming. So yeah. she did come to. Yeah. She was screaming. She was unconscious. She was. No, she was. She looked like she was when I got there, but yeah. she, whether she was or not, I don't know. But she looked like someone that had just passed out, and then she was screaming. Mm. So it's yeah. quite hysterical. I was imagining my head of being stunned or something like that. You know, but mm -hmm. that may not be accurate. I don't know. Passed across the shame, but his response. So there were several students who were identified as being adversely affected by what happened at Westall that day. Several girls. Uh, Tanya was one of the students who was most commonly named. Some people can remember who it was. Um, every, uh, when we went to the school, Westall High School, we found these student record cards for uh, about half, maybe three quarters of the uh, students in 1966. We found a card for a girl called Tanya. There were only two um, Tanyas or Tanyas at the school that year, so um, And the card for Tanya had her, had the information for when she started at the school, but nothing after that, which was at odds with every other student's record card, which had when they started, which primary school they came from, and when they left the high school. And if they went to another school after Westall High School, which school they went to, there was no information on the card like that for Tanya. Now I want to go to this side here. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, oh, sorry. Yes, 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 go on. Um, the other students who were uh, in relation to Tanya, um, you can't get hospital records for people mm. unless you are that person or you are a relative of that person. So we couldn't go down that path. The ambulance records aren't kept from that time. I went down that path with the ambulance service. Uh, just recently, I've tried very hard to find perhaps the ambulance officers who went to Westall High School that day. And um, we, we think we know which ambulance station they came from. The Angadong ambulance station, the old one. I drove past it last night actually with uh, James from Bufalba. Um, and one of the ambulance officers <coughs> vaguely remembers a story like the Westall story, but nothing more than that. And it's possible that the ambulance officers involved are no longer alive. Uh, two or three other girls were identified as being affected badly by what happened at Westall. Uh, one of those I was able to track down, uh, and unfortunately that girl received electroconvulsive therapy. As a teenager, not related to the Westall incident, but erased all of her memories from her teenage years. And she's now no longer really able to remember much about what happened at Westall. She can remember being there, she vaguely remembers the flying saucer incident, but not her role in it. One of the other girls who was named as having been affected, who went off and got medical treatment, and then came back to the school. I've never been able to track her down, I have her name. And the people who remember her being affected, they say when she came back, everybody was forbidden from talking about the incident, including this girl, Sue was her name. But she wouldn't talk about it, but she would draw pictures mm -hmm. of what she saw, because she was quite a good drawer, and she would show that to her friends. And when the Studio 10 program aired last year in April, another new witness came forward who had been so adversely affected by what she saw. She was in the sports ground at the time. She was so frightened by what she saw, she actually wet her pants. And she went home and she told her father about what had happened. And her father treated her so badly, but, um, demanded that she not talk about it. Um, ended up breaking her arm. And in the end, without letting her father know, the school, which the high school, arranged for her to receive counselling with a school counsellor at a different school up the railway line. And they paid for that. And they put her on the train, and she'd go up there during school hours and come back again before the end of school so that she, she could go home and her father wouldn't know that it had happened. And, uh, and that took more than um, 10 years for that witness to come out of the woodwork, if you like, and share that story with us. So, be a little bit of an insight. Okay. Very good. That's right, the
Any questions from over this side of the room? I'm trying to sort of go everywhere. Yes, down here, Mike. Maybe just come around here with the mic. Mike and the mic. My name is Chris. I just want to know if there's any UFOs in Melbourne that day prior or after this is. Do you want to know about any? I can't shed any light on it. Shane, it'd be the... Well, there's well, there are sightings in Melbourne area mm -hmm. that day. Or this or on that day? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, Dee's talked about what the sightings she saw up. at Clayton North State School. Yeah. And there were reports of people along Clayton Road also seeing something. Yeah. And there was a factory, the Robert Bosch yeah. factory yeah. in Santa yeah. Road, between yeah. Westville High School and uh, yeah. Clayton North State School. And uh, a witness some years ago contacted us saying that she was at the factory that day and she and some other co workers had seen the flying saucer go past the window as it went north south down to Bristol. Um, in terms of other sightings on that day, uh, um, not so much, but there's been one or two. Uh, a couple of people have contacted me to say they remember the Bristol sighting happening and they had a sighting as well within that 24 hour, 48 hour period. Now whether it was the same thing that happened at Westville, the same objects, in a way it seems likely, I mean, how many objects would there be coming from how many different places on one day to Melbourne? So you would think it's probably the same thing. So there have been a, a, a couple, a couple. Hmm. I, I'd like to add something about too, that a lot of those records have uh, probably disappeared now too, um, from the old Victorian Flying Sources Society. Um, their records have been scattered to the winds across the state. Some of us ended up in, in rubbish ships and, uh, you know, certain people have certain information. But, uh, yeah, that's, it gets harder to track some of, those other, some of those other stories. But, yeah, I'm sure they are out there too. Okay, any other questions at all? Let's have a look through. So, yeah, over here, we're long sitting too. There you go, Barry. Mike. <coughs> uh, my name is Barry. I'd like to make a statement and then I have a question for Shane. Thanks. Sure. Uh, my statement is that exactly a year after Westall, uh, the Crestview School in Upper Loppa in Miami, Florida, had a four day visit from several <coughs> UFOs. It's not very well known in Australia, but it has been written up in the UFO literature. Four days. That's my question for Shane. Shane, I'm so grateful for all the work you've done and how you've kept given this situation real drive and punch and kept at it. Congratulations. Um, I seem to remember you had someone report to you that their father, who may have been a, 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 a state a public servant who may have been able to give you some information that he died and his daughter was trying to be in touch with you. If that's vaguely true, could you put us in the right context, please, and let us know what you have established. Thank you. It's gone past you. Barry, I'm glad you mentioned the Crestview Elementary School sighting. That happened a year to the day after the Westall sighting. It happened on the 6th of April 1967, uh, in the place that you mentioned. And it has so many parallels with the Westall story. It's uncanny, unbelievable, involving a science teacher, the first teacher to see it, his class of elementary primary school children. And it happened over about three days. The Air Force came to the school. The flying saucers were seen flying over a paddock on the other side of the street from the school in an open, grassy, sandy area. Uh, students remember seeing the flying saucers fly into the trees and disappear, and then fly out of the trees again. The trees didn't move. The flying saucer didn't change shape in and out. Uh, so there are lots of interesting parallels with that. And um, the Discovery Channel Canada was very uh, gracious and flew me over to Toronto to film an episode on that story. And I was interviewed for that, as well as a couple of other American investigators. And uh, 
did a good job of, uh, of portraying that story. And I've been in contact over the last few years with quite a few of those witnesses from Crestview, both uh, students and teachers. The public server that you mentioned, so after the Westall 66 documentary aired, not that long afterwards, the daughter of a very high-ranking federal public servant who worked for a very large government department called the Department of Supply, which years later morphed into the Defence Science and Technology Organisation. Uh, she contacted uh, me and, and Rosie, really, to say thank you so much for making that documentary because my father was there that day and he had been sent there to Westall to investigate and he was so affected by what he had seen that he was never the same again. And he tried very hard to get the uh, authorities, I guess, the government, to look at it seriously. But so much pressure was put on him by those who were above him. And he, you have to keep in mind, was the fourth highest ranking public servant in the Department of Supply. So he was very high ranking. There were very few people above him. But he put so much pressure on him to not talk about it, to keep quiet that she blamed his death, which happened uh, just four years later, in 1971, on what happened at Westall. And she was so grateful that the story was coming out into the public um, marketplace, if you like. And her father initially talked to her about it. She was nine years old at the time. She had a brother, who had also been in touch with and confirmed similar details. And her father said to her, now, I've told you this now, and I'm not going to speak to you about it ever again. You have not to talk to any of your schoolmates about it, but I've talked to your teachers even. And she never did. However, she would discuss it uh, via her mother. And her mum and, and her would sometimes talk about it, and the effect it was having on her dad, uh, her mum's husband. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, he's now dead, the wife is now dead. And the son said to me that her, his father had a, a box of stuff, documents, secrets, and his uh, command, if you like, was that on his death, that that box of secrets go into the fire. And so we think if there was anything kept about my school by him, it went into that fire. So uh, that's that story. Uh, the daughter's still alive, the son's still alive. Uh, we are trying to get more information about the story from their viewpoint, from their vantage point. They don't want to talk about it very much. The daughter is married to a very high-ranking former naval officer. The son is a former Australian Federal Police Officer and Intelligence Service Officer. There's only so much to say. Very good. Yeah, there's another question up the back here. Uh, gentleman raising his hand, we're on the right on the spot. Um, just a question to the panel and to uh, Shane and Rosie. Um, now, Shane and Rosie, I read a story, and I'm not sure if this is accurate, whether it was uh, produced by the authorities to debunk the Westall story, but it would explain why the authorities were there so quickly. and. What I read was that the US and the Australian military were conducting experiments, setting things up in the atmosphere to detect nuclear explosions. Um, and that, <coughs> according to the story, it was being conducted around the, the time of the Western incident occurred. Um, hence, maybe it explained why the authorities were there so quickly. I don't know if, it, what, if it, come across that at all through your research and to the panel. Um, your stories are very consistent and fascinating. Um, what um, I find a little bit frustrating is the description of the object itself. Um, now, there was that photo taken um, on the second paper, I think. The, was it Born? Born, yeah. yeah. How different... And, and the panel described the object being on its side, and that photo was a classic example of that. So every time they um, tell the story, my, my mind goes back to that photo with the object on its side. 
How different is the shape of that object to the object with the panel saw? Well, it was a lot. It seemed to be a lot higher. I thought. Oh, sorry. It seemed to be a lot higher than what I remember it. It was the, shape, shape. the actual shape. The actual shape of the. Object. Well, it was more like a bell to me. That photo that yeah. was in that magazine. Yeah. Yeah. What I saw was more like a flat no, no. disc. Not no, really totally the same different. shape. It was different. Yeah, I think that the nearest one that uh, that I actually saw, um, there was a guy by the name of Campbell, um, put out posted something that was as close as I've seen. Yeah. You know, to, to what what is familiar to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, what a uh, Rod Campbell or, or something like that. But I, I saw a series of uh, photos, um, you know, of various craft and what have you, and that was the nearest that I actually mm -hmm. saw. You know, to what I saw. Yeah. But yeah, look, it did, um, you know, obviously, yeah, it did turn up on, on its side. Um, yeah. I mean, I also sort of think, you know, maybe these things can, you know, just throw it out there that, you know, maybe they can potentially shape shift. You know, and like, it's not, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that they're both the same object at all, but, you know, we do need to be, to be open minded about, you know, we, we all saw what we saw. Paul saw something slightly different on the exact same day. Uh, the, the Baldwin photo, while has some broad similarities, it's certainly located in time to the event. They might have different types, though. I mean, well, we've got Porsches and Hummers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it they could be a distant on the end day. Yeah, tie them off, who knows? So I might pass to Shane for his comments. And just about the first part of your question. So the government program that we're referring to, I think, is the Highball program which is the High Altitude Balloon Program, as you said it was testing for residue, nuclear atomic residue from testing or explosions of devices in the atmosphere, a program that was run jointly by the Australian Department of Supply and the US Atomic Energy Commission. And uh, it was active at the time, and the, there is a researcher, a good con, um, colleague of mine called Keith Bassenfield, who works out of Adelaide, and he discovered that there had been a flight scheduled for the day before, the 5th of April, from Mildura. They were mostly launched from Mildura. Um, and he just wondered, he put it out there, is it possible that that flight was delayed, sometimes they were, and happened later on the 5th of April or earlier on the 6th of April, and somehow made it all the way from Mildura down to Westall. Now, mostly those high ball balloons didn't make it that far. A lot of them didn't go very far at all, they deflated all that malfunction. But of course, uh, it's a possibility. Now the records for all of the flights were pretty much extant, they were found, but the records for that flight scheduled for the day before were never found. And uh, the records that they would have been put into at the National Archives are no longer in existence, they've been lost or thrown away. So it's most likely that we'll never find out. Now while it's a possibility there may have been some connection, I, for one, uh, don't entertain it as a very good explanation because if you listen to the descriptions of the witnesses and what they saw and how the object behaved, it doesn't really correlate in any reasonable way with how you would expect a high altitude balloon's um, array because it was a balloon on top of a, um, a parachute and underneath the parachute would be the um, the array or the gondola with the equipment. And nothing at Westall was ever retrieved. There was a big response to what happened at Westall, but not a single witness has ever come forward to say, we saw the authorities picking something up and taking something away. And it's hard to imagine how a equipment gondola crashing to the ground, and it would certainly just come down and crash would leave a perfectly formed circle of grass. Uh, so there are those sort of dissonances, so it's very hard to entertain that as a plausible explanation. But as I said in my speech earlier, I think I did, I'm not committed to any particular uh, conclusion, any particular result, I just want the one that's right. And that doesn't seem to be the right one, but it's worth looking at every single possibility. I, I think it's uh, it's important that people, you know, like obviously through uh, through this uh, forum here and uh, through our other various forum, uh, forums, we're ecstatic that um, that people are actually talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The more people that sort of get it out there, 
we might get that person come forward that, yeah. uh, that uh, has an answer for us. We would love an answer. Can I? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, no, sorry, we do. Kevin just wanted to say. I just wanted to say something further about um, going on from what um, Shane just said about this possibility of a high altitude balloon. Um, on the second day, when, when I went down with my mate on, on the bike and we went down to the Grange to, to look at, um, at where we'd seen, where I'd seen the surf on the, on the previous day, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned there were there were military people on the field with with devices that looked to me at the time like Geiger counters or metal detectors, and there was at least three or four of them doing that, and they were very carefully going around examining the ground. Um, so to my mind, if it was a balloon, why on earth would they be exam examining the ground um, with, with, with devices like that? And then, of course, a week later when I went back and they removed all the grass and, and burnt the area of the circle, uh, it just doesn't smack to me like something, something that was a, was a balloon in the air but it certainly seems to me like they're trying to destroy evidence, something that we are not supposed to know about. Yeah, that's, that's a very, very clear comment. <coughs> right here. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, attending today. My name is Tony, and I'm one of the people from that primary school. Which, um, I know there's too many people here from the primary school. Yeah, which uh, which primary school? Sorry. We're, we're still. We're still primary school. Yeah, sure. And um, yeah, for years I've always wondered. Um, my mum and I went back on the weekend on the Saturday to investigate when the uh, UFO came down in the grass. And we saw a, a young lady there. I still remember screaming and carrying on, grabbing everything that she could like, get hold of because her parents were trying to drag her back to where this UFO came down just to satisfy that there's nothing there. But this girl just would not have it. And I thank you for showing you maybe give me a bit of uh, insight of who it may have been. But um, yeah, the memories still linger on. And just always look above. There's always something out there. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. what, what level were you at, uh, Tony, at, uh, at uh, primary school on, in 66? Oh. I think it was grade Five and grade yeah. four, grade five. Yeah, yeah. But that's it's fine. just um, it's stuck with me for years, and I've told my grandson, and now he looks to the size, and mm -hmm. I've shown him the videos. I've got the video. Yeah, you're, you're like us, mate. Yeah, you're, you're very much like us. Yeah. So. Well, all right, you know, I have found that you talk about it, people look at you rather strangely, but <laughs> I find nowadays that people come and ask you about it, mm -hmm. then I'll tell them. Mm -hmm. So. Come across a couple of other people that have known things about it. But um, there's a lot of people that are interested that just won't come out and say anything. So if you know something, say something. Yeah, you're not in your own, mate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You. Absolutely. I hope, we've, yeah. I hope you've uh, yeah, gained you know, something from us too, mate. So, okay. Yeah, All the best. Something. Sure. Tony has highlighted something. Uh, the Westall State Primary School and the Westall High School. And um, of the 200 plus witnesses I've had in contact with, about 40 were students at Westall State School. Um, the deputy principal of Westall State School in 1966 came to our very first reunion back in 2006. And he told us of how he was out on an errand at the time the flying saucer incident happened. And he came back to the State School and he'd never seen children in such a state. He'd never seen the children so scared so quiet, sitting huddled together, and they had witnessed this, as he later found out, this flying saucer incident. And after the Studio 10 program aired in April last year, a couple of days later, a lady contacted me to say she was the daughter of one of the teachers at Westall State School. And after the Westall 66 documentary aired a few years ago, her mum, the teacher from Westall State School, for the very first time, in 40 years, told the story how she was there that day as a teacher. She'd never mentioned it to her husband or either of her two children, and she'd seen the flying saucer. She'd witnessed the reaction it caused amongst the students, and the next day, she told them. People in suits came to the staff room and said to the other teachers, if you talk about what you've seen, none of you will teach again in this state. 
this is the same at Whistle. The story is not together. And she obeyed. And she never even told her husband. And her husband was a police officer. He knew nothing about the Whistle incident until she made this confession, if you like. Unfortunately, she had passed away. Um, but the daughter uh, checked again with her father, checked with her brother, and they confirmed the story that um, the mother had told them. So it's amazing how long people can keep secrets. That's a very, very good point. We have a question up the back there, Mike, if you head up there. Hand raised. <laughs> Watch his knees. Thank you all for your time this afternoon. Uh, my name is Anne, and I guess um, obviously something very real happened in 1966. And I guess a question for the filmmaker, the researcher, and the engineer on the panel if there's been any thought about trying to reverse engineer the uh, object that was found or was seen to see if it could be recreated with today's advances in technology. Change of attitude to the 
possibility of life out there. Yeah, I like to think of the Star Wars cantina scene. <laughs> yeah. Where they're all in there, from all different places, the boots are playing, and you've got, you know, all the little angry guys that scurry a bunch from across the galaxy. It's part of the movie. It is, it is. And, you know, and it's, it may not be an unreality. I mean, you know, just because we are on the, the outer arm of a, you know, of an average galaxy doesn't mean that there's, there's fun parties going on elsewhere, um, you know, into into species interactions. So I see that Irene has her hand up, one of our organisers. You have a question? Yeah. <laughs> Victor was a very good artist yes, in his was. time. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Has he captured it for you, do you think? Sorry? Has he captured it for you? I would have thought it's slightly different, but it's very similar. Yeah, it's very similar. similar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know you've got a you know, car crash and you've got witnesses and everyone describes something slightly different yeah. as to what happened and what speed they were going and how many people were there. And it's just it's the nature of an investigation yeah. that you know, one of the things is, is that there's a lot of, there can be a lot of variety for the same experience. And on that note, um, what was the psychological effect, do you think, of this, this oh, event? Yeah. For me, none. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Laurie. Has right? it in my life, has it affected me in any way, or I just believe on the story? Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've, uh, we've all gotten on with our lives pretty well. But uh, that probably leads into a into a, a section as why did we see it so clear? Yeah, and um, you're talking about, uh, about people who saw something 51 years ago. In every one of us, uh, we have certain events that happen uh, yep. yeah, to us um, in everyday life. Uh, occasionally, something comes along that um, is a little bit out of the ordinary. And there were so many things that happened on that particular day. Yes, we can remember it. We haven't forgotten it. And, uh, and that is one of those days that, uh, that you know, like, um, it's like things the, that happened to us. Uh, that we, we yeah, remember. it's like the birth of your first child or something like that. You know, something that's just so strong in, in your mind. It never leaves, never. Because it's just, the, it, it's there. It's a memory that's just so... For me, personally, um, at times of obviously over the years, you know, not spoken about it a lot because of ridicule and other things, but as I've got older, I don't care anymore about what other people think. I was there, I saw it, I know, it. it's in my head, I cannot get it out. So if I want to worry about it and make it, let it drive me insane, because I'm other people don't believe I have something in my head that I saw. I don't care anymore. I know. I, I know it's there. It, it's just something that was so <coughs> exciting and just so memorable that it just doesn't leave. Some things are not as quite as clear, and other things are like it happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something? I was just going to say that because I was so young and couldn't share my story or know that other people had seen it, like I was very isolated with that. Mm -hmm. um, for my 20s, 30s, I had my children, I shared with them, I knew it was real, like what I saw. Mm -hmm. And until I saw the magazine and got in touch with Shane, that's when yeah, it was a relief. Mm -hmm. I could share it and, and it was true, it was tangible, other people had seen it. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it was, it, it was a good thing. Yeah. yeah, very good. Yeah, so I, I personally think that everyone here was privileged <laughs> who had the opportunity to, uh, to observe this, these yep. objects on that particular day. Not too many of us perhaps get such a front row seat to... Maybe we're the chosen ones. <laughs> Maybe. 
maybe it's like a moon. A moon, that's a camera movie. Absolutely, yeah, of course, George has said we're privileged to have everybody here today. Uh, but everybody who's here today, audience, um, the panel, and Shane and Rosie, and everything, it's just magnificent. Now I've got to put my hand up. Okay, Ron's got one. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I was just thinking, um, a lot of Ron no reports refer to craft as being like session beings. Is anyone suffer from any thought of that era, or is there any other witnesses? Thought of some craft as being a living entity, or? No. no. Or is it actually phasing out instead of just lifting up into the sky? No. In and out of the Like with me, I thought it was an aeroplane. But it didn't have that tail, and then it just went around. So, I get it, but it's, everyone thinks it's a craft, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Solid for me. Yeah. Were, were, we, were we scared? No. no. That's, that's an interesting point. You were not scared. No, yeah. excited. It's good. Yeah. Excited. Keep on. Awesome. Yeah. Bring it on. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so silly. Okay. Are you here? Hi, guys. Uh, just one short question back to the uh, issue of uh, the lady who, the girl who painted. Has any of the affected students come close to the craft when it's been done? Terry did. Oh, yeah, yes. mm. oh, Terry Terry reasonably close, yeah. Mm. Can you? Within, oh, meters, yes. within meters, yeah. yeah. A few, few meters. I didn't touch it, no. no. Did Terry, did um, Tanya? Tanya, I don't know because she was already hysterical meters away from it when I got there. I imagine, don't think she did. Yeah, can you imagine meters from a, from a flying saucer, what that experience must be like? And just be meters away. I mean, it's awesome, exactly. It would be, it'd be beyond yeah. words, I think. So, any other questions out there? Oh, we've got hands waving. You come down the front here. I oh, just want to see you real clearly. Uh, really, it's like staring into a UFO up here. Thanks. <coughs> um, just want to thanks for taking the time out of your uh, life schedules and um, share your experiences. And wow, well, this is what my girl sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've actually got um, three questions. Um, one I think is for Terry, probably came the closest to uh, one of the products. Um, did you uh, see anything, and I would imagine or assume that you've been to that path or range where all those palm trees were? Mm -hmm. Did you see anything un uh, unfamiliar or strange about the trees themselves? On the day? Yeah, on the day. No. Okay. No. Um, the other question is, and I apologise if this comes across very as a sceptic, but I'm not sceptical. Um, it's just that um, I have a very visual brain and I like to put timeline and spatial pictures in my mind as to how it happened. And I think my question is for Paul. Um, we were working out in the field at the time. Um, we were you wearing a watch and were you feeling it becoming hungry? I didn't own a watch at that time. I didn't own a camera. Sundial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have a Sundial. watch. Okay, and, it's just, and the only reason why I asked um, if you were doing the pictures is because you said it was probably around the early morning films. Yeah, um, I sort of time. had a good idea of the time because it was about half an hour before lunch. Okay. And uh, my, we sort of knew how far, how much work we had to do before lunch, yeah. And um, my other question, sorry, <laughs> uh, for Kevin, um, what kind of engineer are you and are you, would you be able to provide some insight as to um, some of the, uh, if you're a structural engineer or electrical engineer? I'm electrical. Okay. okay. Um, so do you think that these crafts actually operate uh, under, say, non nuclear or uh, combustible uh, fuels and more electrical, given the characteristics and behaviours of these types. Oh, I'm afraid that's a bit technical. <laughs> uh, first of all, I didn't actually see the craft. I saw the I saw the um, uh, the circle in the grass. Um, I, I really can't 
kind of comment on that. As I said before, to my mind, if they're crafted out from this world, um, they obviously be using some technology that's far beyond um, what we know at the moment. The only reason why I, I, I ask this is because, um, as you're probably aware, um, uh, England has um, electricity and it actually creates its own field, electromagnetic uh, field, um, that can include power lines, and there are some electronic yeah. devices out there that have batteries I mean, that we charge. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't gone past my mind yet. Yeah. But that it could have been a possibility um, that these craft could be sucking up energy from the power line. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't cancel it as a possibility. But again, I think the point is you must keep an open mind. Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, you know, the humming, you know, might be say humming might be connected to electricity, but that could be completely wrong too. It's, we're all really, you know. Let's see with this, I suppose. There's a question over here. The gentleman with the hand raised in here, Mike. Mike with the mic. Oh, hi. My name's Brett. Um, and look, thank you all. And especially to Shane, you've done an enormous amount of work here. But um, I'm just, I think it's Terry. Um, you said you were metres away from the craft. Um, in relation to your own height, how high would it have been? Would it, have been? it was raised up. It was raised slightly off the ground when I got there. Um, it wasn't. It didn't appear to be very tall. Um, I'd say maybe from the ground a couple of metres at the most. It didn't seem to be. Well, say from the ground where I'm sitting, I suppose yeah. about that height. That's not very high. Yeah, it went up slightly in the middle a little bit, so I, it was it was fairly shallow, really. And which leads me to think that. Did you have any thoughts about, not that you would necessarily know, about whether the college was occupied or whether it was a drone type thing? Uh, look, in my mind I probably thought there was someone in it, to be honest, because, you know, he brought up the thing that aeroplanes have to have someone flying them, so I, I probably always thought there was someone in it, but I certainly didn't see anyone, and I don't remember any windows, I just remember the lights around underneath it, because it was already raised up a bit when I got there, um, but no, I didn't see anybody, but I would think that there was probably someone in it, but mm. who knows. Was it a light, a clear light, like an LED light? Or oh, look, it was it's so hard to remember exactly. They yeah. were a bluey colour, that's all I can remember. Bluey colour. Bluey, purpley sort of colour. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Up uh, the back, yeah, yeah. Just, want, just wanted to ask, um, what was the fate of the teachers and Mr. Greenwood? What was the what? Fate. Fate of. Fate. Fate. Oh, Mr. Fate. Mr. Greenwood? Well, he was here for the rest of the year. Yeah. Yeah. That was his very first year of teaching at Teachers College. Uh, he was quite young. Uh, he, the very next year, he transferred to a private school in Melbourne. And he taught there for a very long time. He never went back to teaching in government schools. He was so upset, so angry with how he had been dealt with by the headmaster at Westall High and also by the education department and having his job threatened that he felt like he needed to move on. And he wanted to get away from Westall High because he was tagged as being the flying source of future. And that Reputation followed him to his new school, um, and there were kids who would come up to him from time to time and say, Mr. Greenwood, are you Mr. Greenwood who taught at the Flying Saucer School? So things like that happened. Um, Mr. Greenwood's still alive, he's retired now, he's farming a property in rural Victoria. He expressed interest in coming today, but unfortunately, just in fitting with his schedule. Um, so he's alive, he's well. And he remembers the story vividly. And his primary interest, and he said this in an email to me just a week ago, he's not so much interested in the UFO aspect of the UFO. He's interested in why the government responded in the way they did. Yeah. Why did they come around to his home, bang on the door, he opened it, he thought they were coming around to interview him about what he had seen. They were coming around to put the hard word on him and threaten him. And he remembers he said this to me when I spoke to him on the phone. More than 
the vivid memory of seeing the flying saucer, the memory of these two Air Force officers trying to pull the wool over my eyes. At once they were trying to say, flying saucers don't exist, and you were not to talk about it. And he remembers thinking, wait a moment, if flying saucers don't exist, what does it matter to you if I say I saw one? So uh, he was angry, and he was upset, and uh, that still lives with him today. He wants to know why the government treated him and the students and the school and the story in the way that they did. He did ask us to send his regards to his former students. He <laughs> <laughs> did. Pass on his regards to his former students. Has he still got the MG? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Has he still got the MG? <laughs> but, but thank you very much. My name's Dale. I'm the Innovation Historical Society so I met before uh, Rosie um, and Shane. And um, my question is this sort of two-part question. Uh, but first, as I need to say, since I've got the mic, um, it's, it's really good that the guys who come here today and talk about their experiences because uh, my, my mother was certainly um, a witness to this. So she was uh, working at Rock Bosch and it was hard for her to talk about it. She mentioned it to me probably 10 years after the event and we discussed it in 2006, I think, when this was all happening. And she spoke to Rosie. Um, but she wouldn't talk about it for fear of ridicule. Um, you know, she came from that era. Um, so it's good that you've come forward and uh, speak in that regard. And my two questions uh, basically come down to the conspiracy theory in a way. The first one is um, to the, uh, I'll, I'll just say them now. One's to the um, uh, witnesses. Did you remember, you were talking about planes flying over at the time. Um, do you remember aeroplanes, the numbers of aeroplanes, heights, were they, why were they noticeable? Were they flying lower than usual? Was there a cloud of planes or one or two that were more than you might usually see? And the other question will be to the researchers, I guess, is um, showing the nine figures a number of times in this and including, I think, in the paddock, um, if I remember correctly, I might be wrong there, but um, has anyone spoken to any camera people or tried to chase up the camera and the camera people were at the time and the interviewers? Thank you. Yeah, I think there was five. Two, about five. Five no, more than normal, because there was yeah. always a lot of yeah. light aircraft flying around. And, and they were always way. visible, because yeah. it sort of was But they seemed to be more, and they, were just, they seemed to be hovering, or not hovering, as in flying saucers, but a few of those. Yeah, a lot more. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Certainly around. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Interesting to why you sent assessments to chase after UFOs, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you're scrambling a... Yeah, you know, a save a jet or something to yeah. go right. out there and chase them. Why do you send up little, little slow assessments? Grab an airport, it's only three k away. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I'm not even sure. We were the F-triple-1s uh, around then? Because uh, I know the training uh, craft they had around the time we were, we were away. Yeah. Just they had that out. Um, but there were vampires around too around that period. I'm not so sure that the uh, F triple ones were around. I, I don't know, I can't remember. Oh, was the the Sorry. Just throw it the same At that stage, the RAAF, uh, we did have the remains of vampires in service, yeah. but we mainly had our 86 sabers. Sabers, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, across the shop, the uh, gentleman's question. Uh, those uh, aircraft, by the way, the people reported them as being flying Cessnas, or possibly Pipers, the sort of aircraft that people were familiar seeing from Moraine. And there was some, there was some story that maybe those planes had come from the Royal Aero Club of Victoria, which was and still is headquartered in Moraine. Um, no one knows. But the aircraft didn't look like military aircraft. They weren't uh, grey or silver. They didn't have any military markings. They looked like civilian aircraft. We don't know. Uh, in relation to Channel 9, we were able to track down the original journalist, Gordon Lee, who had covered the story, and, and before he passed away. The cameraman, unfortunately, um, Keith Fella, had already passed away at that point. But Gordon remembered the story very clearly. He remembered covering the story. There were lots of flying sources of stories around that era, uh, but he remembered the one so clearly because it was so unusual. It was broad daylight, hundreds of witnesses. 
uh, the response of the authorities. Uh, in relation to the Channel 9 film going missing, do you think that's particularly unusual? Because the film got lost, it got recycled, it got thrown out. So he didn't read anything necessarily conspiratorial into it. Uh, but it was good to be able to speak to him and to hear his memory of being there that day and to say with him all those years. Up the top there, it was wrong. Um, my question is for Shane. You're looking for the smoking gun. Have you analysed the soil for any radioactivity or any type of radioactivity in recent um, years? Couldn't quite see where that question was coming from. Where the uh, craft landed. Okay. Oh, there you go. There is it. Oh, sorry. Where oh, there you go. Yes. Where the craft landed, or it's left like a crop circle almost, yeah. that the soil will be contaminated. Has it been tested? And even recently. So we thought about doing that um, as part of the film, didn't we, Rosie? Um, was it like a honey? Budget. Part of the issue was not being able to be 100 percent sure where the circle or circles were, and we still aren't 100 percent sure. I'm relatively sure that I've narrowed it down to at least three different places that seem to be fairly uh, likely for being the location of the circles. Um, unfortunately, for two of those locations, they're now covered in either asphalt, a street, or Brady Avenue next to the school, um, or housing immediately south of the Western schools. The other location, uh, one or two locations, is at the Grange, and next to the Grange, unfortunately the one next to the Grange is now the Clayton South landfill. Um, so that's out of the question. Possibly, if there was radioactivity associated with whatever this was. Yeah. So we thought about that, Rosie, didn't we? We did think about it, but it, it was so difficult to actually decide which location might be the most likely, um, as Shane said, there were so many changes in the area. Um, could be smoking down there. Sure, could be, but I guess, yeah, it seemed like a long shot, put it that way. The climb of tree that Paul remembers the object flying into, very fortunately still stands there today, minus one tree which fell down a week ago. Um, don't blame Paul for that, though. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with Paul. Um, that climb of tree still exists. Um, and some people, George has mentioned in the past, I remember, other people have mentioned possibly doing some sort of testing on those trees. Um, I guess that remains a possibility, but I don't know. Okay, well that's pretty much for us to uh, conclusion, but if there's any last minute questions, there will be an opportunity out here to have a chat to the witnesses uh, directly with the one-on-one -on -one if you would like to do so. Uh, you know, this is an unfunded thing, like no one pays your money to do this. Uh, so, you know, your contribution helps us to do what we do to, to investigate further because the authorities are not going to help us. So thanks very much everyone. There will, you can grab a drink out there um, at the bars. At the bar will have drinks at bar prices if you'd like to hang around. If you need to catch a, um, a bus or something, that's okay too, sorry. Yeah, I've got a few pages about this question from several fronts. But just to conclude, put your hands up if you've seen a UFO. Yeah, well, there's lots to talk about, isn't there? So, thank you everyone. I look forward to seeing you outside.